Welcome back. Last time we linearized the GPS navigation equation. We linearized the pseudo ranges. In other words, we figured out how to treat the fact that the estimanda x u, y u, z u appear squared and underneath the square root. So now we're ready for perhaps the most exciting part, which is, well, how do we solve them? Let's take a look. We're going to put it here in a slightly different fashion. The top equation is the pseudo range. We've talked about that. The second equation with the characteristic subscript 0, or just called 2 tau mu naught, is the Theo range. As we mentioned, our strategy was just to take these two things and difference them. Nothing more elaborate or less elaborate than that. The difference is called delta tau. It's the residual or the innovation. And it's a function of a bunch of things. And we've just for completeness drawn out the whole thing here. When linearized, we discover that the estimanda that we care about, the three-dimensional vector which connects the assumed location to the true location, dotted with the line of sight. Now when we were using east, north, up, that appeared as a sequence of terms of the form cosine L sine as, cosine L cosine as, sine L, and then out here is the last remaining estimanda, delta B U, and it had the coefficient 1, and these things appear here. When we write it in this style, showing that line of sight factor as being a 1 with an underscore, that traditionally indicates that we're now using the Earth-centered, Earth-fixed reference frame. So that's that Cartesian XYZ frame with its origin at the mass center of the Earth. Either way is fine. And for the purposes of this discussion coming up, it's, it's fine to think about it either way. Here are the errors. Here's the delta xk. That's the error in the location of the satellite. So that's the error inclusive in the navigation message. It, too, gets dotted on to the line of sight vector. Don't confuse this with this. This is a small thing, an error of a few meters at most. This is the estimanda we so desperately care about dotted into the first row or the kth row of the geometry matrix. Don't confuse them. Delta I, the error in our ionospheric prediction. Delta T, the error in our tropospheric prediction. Once again, here's an estimanda. Don't confuse it with its neighbors. I'll put a box around those vital things. And here's delta capital B, the error in the satellite clock relative to its own broadcast. Here's new with no tilde. What we do here is draw new with a tilde, by which we mean we have taken all of these error terms and we've included them in there. We have just smooshed them all in there. So our belief, and in fact the reality when we do that, is that we've figured out how to make those error terms at least manageably small on the order of one meter or less. When we can do that, we can just treat them in a root sum square fashion and just push them into what I might call super noise. So it's not only natural receiver noise, but the residual error from ionotropo and so forth. When we do that, our equation becomes very beautiful. Delta tau, these are the things that we have in our hand. These are our measurements minus our constructions, is equal to delta xu. Delta xu are the first three terms of the estimanda dotted by those line of sight vectors. Delta B U, 
That's the fourth member of our estamanda, plus a vector of supernoise, where the supernoise is treated as being uncorrelated from satellite to satellite. <clears throat> so the noise appears out here. The estimanda, or the state, appears here. This is the G matrix, and here are our measurements. This is a beautiful thing, please. It is worthy of your study. Enjoy it. Once we have it, we can write it in matrix form, as you see down there at the bottom. So we'll just write delta tau is equal to G delta X plus noise. Each measurement is afflicted by noise. That's a sad thing, and we'd like to make that noise as small as possible. However, each measurement is also sensitive to that thing we so badly want to estimate, delta XU. So what do we do? This problem is particularly straightforward and therefore we'll begin with the case when the number of satellites in view is equal to the number of parameters we want to estimate. So that doesn't really occur that frequently, but start with it. It's, it's a useful starting place. What we're saying is that we have four satellites in view. So the matrix G is square. We have four rows, four columns. The four rows correspond to the four satellites, and the four columns correspond to the four unknowns. In that case, we can look simply at this equation here, make the assumption that the noise is small. Let's ignore it. Let's just set it to zero. Now, if there was something more we knew about the noise, we should have included it earlier on in the delta I, delta T, or whatever. So let's just assume we've done a decent job. What we do at that point is something you'll remember from your linear algebra, is we left multiply this equation by G inverse. And so we'll write then G inverse times delta tau is equal to G inverse times G times delta x. If G inverse exists, G inverse times G will be equal to the identity matrix. And that then will be our estimate of location and time. I think that idea is repeated on the next view graph. Let's have a look. Here it is. I've broken it into two cases. I've just reminded you of the equation we're working up there at the top. Here's the k equal 4 case. <clears throat> I've continued to include the noise in there just so you can see its impact. But if you strike that, consider that to be negligibly small, you'll come to the exact same place that we were a moment ago, that the best estimate of x is equal to g inverse times the vector of our measurements. However, there's a little bit of noise left, and so now let's anticipate an upcoming snippet where we're going to talk about the impact of noise and go ahead and say, well, what can we say about the error in this estimate? If we write now delta xu, that's our best estimate, and absent any noise, the true location x would be g inverse times those perfect noise-free measurements. So we take that to the left-hand side, and we write delta xu minus g inverse delta tau, that being the error in our estimanda, is equal to negative g inverse times the vector nu tilde. I hope you're enjoying this, because it means that that same g inverse that controls the impact of the measurements on our estimate is also the one that controls the mapping of the measurement errors onto our estimate. And that's part of the beauty of this linearized set of measurement equations, and certainly something that we make great use of in GPS. Look, we can call this case here the exactly specified case. 
an algebraist would say that the equations are exactly specified. Provided that G inverse exists, you can go ahead and solve them. Uh, with no information left over, you're going to use it all to go ahead and do your, uh, find your best uh, solution for delta x. Um, under what circumstances does G inverse not exist? Well, if any of the rows are linearly dependent on each other, G inverse will not exist. Think about that in the frame of the G matrix for GPS. To have vectors that have unity length be linearly dependent on each other, that means that they must be pointing in the same direction. So there's a profound sensibility associated with that. That means if two satellites are next to each other in the sky, or very close to each other in the sky, you don't get the credit of two different satellites. They've collapsed and those two rows are identical. So if you have four satellites in the sky and two of them are right next to each other, in that case, you're not going to be able to solve this system because G inverse is not going to exist. Let's go to the case of overspecified. <clears throat> For a GPS user, under open sky, this is almost always the case. To have k equal four satellites in the sky is very rare. To have k equal three or two satellites just never happens under open sky. The GPS constellation today has 31 satellites in it, so the vast majority of time you're in this bottom case overspecified. Now, that means the G matrix is no longer square. <clears throat> it has more rows than columns. It has one column for each estimanda, one row for each satellite, so we might be talking about a 10 by 4 matrix. It's not unusual. So G typically 10 by 4, 8 by 4, 9 by 4, uh, 12 by 4, whatever you think. In that case, we cannot multiply by G inverse. And so we multiply by this function of g instead. That particular product of the g matrices is called the pseudo inverse. Now I apologize. It's not to be confused with a pseudo range. Pseudo range is a false range because of the inclusion of that clock bias. Pseudo inverse just means something like a matrix inverse, but clearly not the same as one. It is the pseudo inverse or the inverse we use when the G matrix is overspecified. The pseudo inverse is used because it has a very, very beautiful property. If we use this particular combination, G transpose G inverse, times g in place of g inverse. Not only do we get an operation that has the right dimensions in terms of the number of rows and columns, but it gives a solution that has minimum value of the measurement residual squared. This is extraordinarily beautiful in my mind. Here's the actual measurement that we make. Here is the row times the estimate that we make in this case of the pseudo inverse. And remember we talked about the measurement residual. And remember we talked about this wish, this feeling that the projection of the estimanda onto the measurement should be small. Now, in the case of an overspecified solution, we cannot make all of those residuals equal to zero. Some of them will be slightly unsatisfied. However, when we take the residuals and square them, and then sum over all k satellites, that solution is called the least squares. And least means just the minimum value of the sum of the residuals squared. So that's why this formulation 
is extremely powerful, extremely prevalent in GPS receivers. It has this nice property of least squared or maximum consonants. By the way, it can be further embellished. You might have some a priori information that one of the satellites is very low in the sky and shouldn't be trusted as much. So you can augment this, you can embellish this least squares by weighting the satellites. We won't take that up here in this course, but please know that that's also a very, very commonplace technique. All told, the navigation solution involves many pieces. And I'd just like to take a moment to review what they are. Uh, the GPS receiver is not a simple thing. Bear in mind that at the most microscopic level, it's doing this correlation operation that we've talked about. It's sliding back and forth a replica to find the maximum correlation with the code included in the received signal. And it does that to get the finest resolution, the least significant bits of the range. And it's uh, sliding back and forth by fractions of a chip width. Remember, a chip width is 300 meters in case of the GPS CA code. And it can resolve things down to 1% or even a tenth of a percent. So something on the order of 30 centimeters. <clears throat> we have to add to those least significant bits the more significant bits associated with, well, how many codes have gone by, or how many overall repetitions of, let's say, the CA code are included in the whole range measurement. And uh, given that the satellite time of transmission is tagged to the bits in the navigation message, we also have to include the impact of how many whole codes are included in uh, one single navigation bits. So correlation is the most microscopic operation. On top of that, we have to add in for whole codes and whole navigation bits to build up the complete pseudo range measurement. The pseudo range measurement is really uh, the subject of the last couple of snippets. It is just that, it's a measurement inclusive of the user cl clock bias. In parallel with that, we build the Theo range. It's a construction based on the broadcast location of the satellite as well as our assumed location of the user. If we take the difference between those two things, that's the residual, and based on that difference, we can convert a nonlinear set of equations into a linear set of equations they are a function of the four unknowns. And so we go ahead and we solve at least four of those equations for the four unknowns. That's it for this snippet. Uh, next time, we'll talk about, more formally, we'll talk about the impact of the G matrix on the accuracy of GPS. Until then, travel well.